All right, good to go. Uh, welcome everybody to the tech, the tech Academy's Tech Talk. Today we're joined by uh, Vander Howen Recruiting Leader, Andrew Owen, just gonna be giving advice on finding a job in software development, um, interview tips, and just creating your best resume. So yeah, feel free to leave any questions you have in the chat box. And thank you for being here, Andrew. Feel free to take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I I am working as well as doing this. And so if any any quick emergencies come up, I might have to respond really quickly on, on Teams or whatnot. But um, somebody in my office knows that they should take care of anything that's uh, that's not super important. So anyways, just wanted to let you know that. I sounds like there is um, is something kind of going down that I might need to quickly quickly respond to just very briefly. Um, but yeah, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm, I'm a recruiter in Portland. Uh, I've been doing this now for, for about 14 years, 12 of them with Vander Howen. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here. I've given this talk a lot of times um, to, uh, to companies, internal you know recruiting staff uh, I've given it to uh, other code schools I've given it to universities um, yeah so at, at, at various places so anyways I'm, I'm really excited to talk with you guys uh, like she said feel free to ask questions at any time please stop me if you have questions um, but none of this is going to be you know like super groundbreaking these are just good reminders because uh, no one is inherently good at interviewing or looking for a job or writing their own resume. It's something that we're inherently fairly bad at. And we we learn to do it through practice. And so with that being said, uh, I'm going to share my fairly low tech PowerPoint because, and let me do that now, just a second. Okay, just can we see that? Yeah, we can. Okay, fantastic. So uh, let's start off with resumes. Uh, so resumes, first of all, like I said, we're none of us are great at writing our own resume, right? And so, and that includes myself. I. I look at resumes, I coach people on resumes, I rewrite resumes, um, and, and I also have people that come to, to me and others at my company after they've paid hundreds of dollars for a professional to write their resume, and they ask us to rewrite them for them. But that being said, I'm, I'm not very good at writing my own, and none of us are. So, uh, but let's talk about some of the, um, some of the core things uh, that we want to see in a resume. So first of all, resumes are just a, a blunt tool to hit a hiring manager over the head with and nothing more, right? And so we tend to take our resumes very personally because we see it as our life's work. But as, you know, when we can kind of depersonalize it and, and just see it as a tool, they tend to be a lot better. Right. And so they're just sometimes we put too much information in a resume. Sometimes, you know, we get stubborn about it and don't want to make changes, et cetera. But anyways, just a just a blunt tool to hit somebody over the head with. Uh, resumes are trendy uh, right now. Speaking to the next little point here, uh, chronological is what we're all looking for versus functional. And what that means is, is that your resume shouldn't have a laundry list of who you are and what you've done, and then just a list of jobs at the bottom. So what we wanna see is, you know, a little bit about you, maybe your tech stack, maybe your education at the top, and then below that, you know what you've done in detail and and andrew yeah no i apologize to interrupt um it looks like no. your presentation is frozen at the moment oh great so we've we've got your browser up but it's not it's 
the screen is frozen. So are, are we still on resumes? Yep, they're important. Can you see that? Can't see that. It says you are presenting, but then it's frozen. Okay, great. I don't know if maybe you could do a refresh. Maybe that'll bring it up. Maybe. Sorry, guys. No worries. Maybe, Lucy, are you able to share my PowerPoint? Oh, just realized I'm on mute. Yeah, I can uh, totally play your um, presentation. Just give me one second and pull it up. Uh, we've got you back, Andrew, but we can't, uh, you're on mute. All right, I am back. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. And thank okay. you very much for doing that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Could we go to the next slide? Sorry about that. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyways, uh, I don't know, I think everybody heard what I said about resumes just being, you know, we need to depersonalize them and just think of them as a tool. Hopefully everybody heard that. And that right now what we're looking for is chronological versus functional. Chronological means that we want to see a little bit of about you, about you at the top of your resume and then a list of your positions below with details. What tends to be easier to read in a resume than like fat paragraphs because we, we all have limited uh, time in front of a hiring manager and people have limited attention spans is quick bullet points. So instead of writing 10 sentences about what you did at a job and just making it a giant paragraph, break it up into quick little bites that are easy to read and easy to see, if that makes sense. And feel free to stop and ask me questions at any time. Uh, <clears throat> as far as how long a resume should be, uh, it, there's no rule anymore. So you don't need to worry about uh, a resume being one page. That's within reason. So if, <clears throat> uh, just a second. So if your resume is two pages, that's great, it's fine. But you don't want it to be long just for the sake of it being long. Like it's not going to be better just because it's longer than the next person's or you know has more has more information. It's it's the quality of the information in the resume versus how many pages it is. Um, as far as what to include on your resume, so because you you all are software developers or, or are becoming software developers and specifically speaking to people that are that are in school right now so you you all have or a lot of you probably have past lives that were outside of technology and you definitely can include some of that stuff but a few tips as far as that goes one i wouldn't go uh, past 10 years on any, any experience that's not related and probably five years. And I wouldn't go into a ton of detail on those jobs if they're not related to this one. But let's say that you were in some kind of analytical type position before this, like talk about that. If you were working at, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond before this, um, you know, folding towels, which is great. I, you know, I probably wouldn't go into a bunch of detail about that, but feel free to list your employment if you would like, okay? What's going to be more important and what to include on the resume, obviously you want your name at the top, you know, email, phone number, a quick, quick about you, but don't worry about the objective. So objectives are are old, don't worry about objectives, okay? And then kind of, please, Eric, go, go ahead. All right, I've got to unmute the mic, so hold on one moment.
All right, go ahead with the question. Hey, it's Eric. Yeah, I was just, uh, as far as, you know, talking about jobs that may not be relevant to coding, you know, I put on my resume that I was an air traffic controller in the Army. I know that has nothing to do with software engineering, but to me, to be an air traffic controller, you have to be very analytical and pay attention to yeah. detail as well. So I didn't know about your opinion on that. Oh, yeah, no, I would definitely list it like feel free to list it what i'm saying is is you don't need to have 15 bullet points about being an air traffic controller right 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 okay. so okay. definitely list it uh and i think that the military experience is fantastic right and so please please list that that's that's great yeah that's what i was hoping for <laughs> yeah yeah okay. no, please 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 do okay Thank and you. uh speaking of that really quick companies do get you know, veteran status credit to hire you as well. So they can, you know, for, for, for that reason, it's also a benefit. So what we're really looking for on the resume though, is we're looking for a quick summary about you. I'm a software developer with three years of experience. And then we want to go down bullet points about what your experience looks like and what it is right maybe maybe four or five at the very top right so uh, i have experience with react i you know have worked in azure you know w whatever you want to talk about but make them relevant to the position that you're applying to and then you know talk about your experience so from what I'm familiar with, with Tech Academy, you all work on some kind of a project while you're here, please list that on your resume. So anything that you have deployed, make sure it's on your resume. And I believe that all of you will do that by the time that you leave this boot camp. So that's super, super important to have on your resume. I would also include anything like GitHub, like your link on your resume, as long as you actually are active, right? And we'll talk about that a little bit later too, uh, because you don't have a lot of experience yet outside of outside of the school. When it comes to software development, it's going to be super important to include that. Um, what you don't need to include, you don't need to include things about your personal life. You don't need to include references. Uh, people people will ask for references if they need them. So you don't need to have a reference section at the bottom. You don't need to include high school education. Uh, it's, it's assumed that you have either a diploma or a GED at the least, right? And then include obviously your education here at Tech Academy and, and any other education that you've had um, above and beyond high school. If you have questions, like I said, feel free to put them in chat or. Yeah, it looks like yeah. Sarah says, um, what's the general feel about coding boot camps by employers? Are they worth pursuing or are they just not worth the cost? Yeah, uh, so that depends on the company, right? And so a lot of companies love people from boot camps. So, uh, and there are a lot of hiring managers also have their own feelings about boot camps and some of them like them and some of them don't. So I think, you know, boot camps being a fairly new thing, right, maybe in the last 10 years or so, there are still some hiring managers that are maybe older and, you know, came from very traditional backgrounds and are kind of stuck in that mode. So, but there are plenty of companies that have had good experiences with people out of code schools that really like them. So one person I can think of for an example, a hiring manager is, da is Daylin Moyer. Uh, she was most recently at Lithia, uh, driveway.com. And before that uh, is approved and loves code schools, for example. And I know of plenty of hiring managers and happy to talk about that outside of here who, who do. Um, and it's one thing that I'm more than happy to help all of you with in the future is like, where should I, should I not apply to? But the list is a little too long to talk about in here. 
Um, yeah, Sarah, please. Okay, maybe let's Hi. Wait. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm coming no. in now. Thanks, Andrew, for answering yeah. my question. Um, I probably should have fra uh, framed it a little bit differently. Um, I was just wondering how we can really pull out the benefits of attending a boot camp to an employer, regardless of what their impressions are. Um, I'm quite new to this, so I don't really know what the perceptions are yeah. of boot camp. So it'd be really great to know, maybe if, if, if you have time, just a summary of what the pros and cons are. Um, it's the first time I'm coming across Tech Academy, so I'm, I'm really interested. Yeah, let's save that one for the very end. Would you mind asking me again at the very end, Sarah? Or I'll... That's absolutely fine, no. yeah. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I, and, and I have definite thoughts on that and happy to speak to it. Yeah. Um, and then kind of lastly here is content versus beauty. Please, please, please do not go out and buy expensive paper. Don't take you know, hours making your resume look pretty. The only exception to all of this is if you're a designer, right? If you are a UI designer or a UX designer, you know, you need to not only have a resume, but a portfolio that looks really pretty. But as full stack developers or back end developers or even front end developers that are not doing pure design, please do not spend an inordinate amount of time making your resume look pretty. We're worried about the content. So don't don't put squiggly lines on your resume or make art for it or do anything else like that. Just just worry about the content and worry about worry about learning how to code. That's more important than anything. Next slide, please, Lucy. Oh yeah, totally. Um, it looks like Judith. She had a question. Oh I please, said, I didn't see it. Uh, what section do you list tech certifications in? Yeah, under education. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you also have certifications, I would make a section that says education and certifications, and that goes under under education, not above it, typically. All right. So uh, recruiters, unfortunately, um, you know, we're a necessary evil uh, and you will have bad experiences with plenty of recruiters uh, in your lifetimes. And, I, and I, I apologize ahead of time. There are, you know, it's just part of, part of this whole thing and some of them are great and some of them are not. And it's just kind of like anything else that you have to do or deal with. Um, but as far as, how to find a recruiter and the good recruiters out there and the bad recruiters. So, I mean, I would just get on LinkedIn and I would type in recruiter in Portland <laughs> and you will see a hundred of them and, you know, just reach out to a few and the people that get back to you and engage with you and are responsive and seem normal, give them a shot. At this stage in your career, when you start looking for a job, you want to have as many people in your corner as possible. So there, you definitely do not want to have a shady recruiter in your back pocket, but try to find several good recruiting companies to work with. You know, I'll, I'll name a few a few names. So I, I like to think that we're okay. So Vander Helen is who I work with. Um, Lexicon recruiting is fantastic. IT Motives is great, and you guys have probably all, all have heard of these names. Um, and there there are several others, but uh, you know, just you want to have as many people working with you and for you as possible. Recruiters do not cost money, um, and any any recruiter that asks for money ahead of time, I uh, just run in the opposite direction. So all of us are paid by companies, not by you. Uh, so when we place you, let's say directly, uh, we're incentivized to get you as much money as possible uh, and we're paid by the company. And so it's really pretty straightforward, just, but please definitely use recruiters in your job search. Yeah, probably always, right? But, but at, especially at the very beginning. Uh, 
a good recruiter will tell you that they don't have anything. Um, they'll be really, you know, if they don't, they'll be really honest with you. They'll be direct and upfront uh, and, and hopefully helpful. And most of us generally know companies that are looking but may not have the budget to work with us. And we're typically more than happy to make, you know, free introductions for you. So having those kinds of relationships is important. Um, job sites, what job sites are relevant right now? Uh, so there are a few, uh, the, the biggest ones right now, Indeed is for sure a, a, a very relevant job site. I would, I would stay glued to Indeed and I would also create automated searches for yourself so that you're getting these emails from Indeed on a daily basis. It's really easy to do. Um, and if you ever need help with that, just let me know. I'll be happy to help you set it up. Uh, LinkedIn, for sure. And you can also create uh, automated searches for yourself on LinkedIn that will send you job ideas on a daily basis. Please do that. Um, Monster and Career Builder are still around. I, I wouldn't say that they're like the most relevant on earth, but again, when you leave this school or when you start really searching for a job, you can't be picky. Uh, and then this one is always funny to people, and it, but it's really pertinent to people that are leaving a code school is Craigslist. So uh, so on the right hand side of the, the front page on Craigslist, you'll see jobs and I'm not talking about gigs but jobs, open up the software QA section and look in there. And I would type in C-sharp or whatever, right? Whatever skill that you think is, is your best skill. Um, <laughs> there are some other code schools who post position or who post things about being a code school in there. I don't believe Tech Academy does. Obviously avoid that. Just, just look for jobs. The companies that typically use Craigslist jobs are typically companies who generally are not great at hiring, like they don't know how to hire, um, which is a benefit. Uh, they typically don't have a ton of money, right? And so they can't go out and get somebody from Facebook who's been doing this for 10 years and is like a principal level engineer, like they're not going to have that kind of money, right? But they might have the kind of money to be able to hire you and get you a really good start in your career. Um, so after you've applied, what next? So, and I get this question a lot from people. So it's not enough typically just to apply for a job, right? And so what, what I would recommend one is please, please do not just apply for one job, but at the same time, don't pepper a company with a hundred different applications at that one company. I apply for one or maybe two positions maximum per company. And I would wait a few days and then follow up with them. And there's a few different ways to do that. One, you could just send them an email. Two, you could try to connect with that person who posted it on LinkedIn. And when they connect with you, send them a message and say, thank you so much for connecting. I applied for a position. So please, uh, you know, don't just wait around for that company to get back to you because they often don't. Uh, Cameron, is it worth taking the time to do the skill assessments on Indeed and Angels List? Yes, please. Again, it's not like you need as much help as you can at this point, right? And so, yeah, do, do whatever you can for sure. Uh, what if I don't have 100% of what they're asking for? So I also get this a lot from people. Um, the concern from people is, is that like, look, Andrew, I, you know, they list like these two things that I don't have. So I didn't apply for it. Like, especially right now, uh, th there is a huge, huge, like lack of talent out there. Um, 
if you have 90% of what the company is looking for, please apply. Some people say 80%, you know, with your own judgment, sure. Basically, if you're missing a few things and they're not like core to the job or what you're missing isn't in the job title, I, I would still apply. And, you know, likewise, if they say that they want three years of experience, that's still pretty junior, I would apply. So worst case scenario, they say no, but as long as you're not applying to things that are completely irrelevant, no one's going to judge you for it. So worst case scenario, they just don't respond to you. That's the worst case scenario. Um, so please, please apply for jobs as long as it's mostly relevant. Uh, networking events. Uh, this is a great way to find a job, especially in Portland. So networking events in Portland, it's a huge thing and it always has been. It's a networking type town, um, especially, you know, it can't be any more important than it ever has been right now, right? Like people want to engage right now and, you know, while they're doing it virtually, they still want to do that, right? And so I would go to as many virtual events as you can. And when things start opening up, I would start going to in-person events. So like, for example, there's a geek dinner that happens that's, a, that's you know, uh, sponsored by PADNUC, the Portland area.net user group. And they have a geek dinner that's on the west side uh, and on the east side. I believe um, that the east side one, I hope you all can't hear my dog snoring, by the way. She's super loud. She's 13. Um, so <laughs> the one on the east side is at Grand Central Bowling. And the one at the west side, I believe it's at Oswego Grill in Beaverton. And you can find that on Meetup. So I would attend as much of that kind of stuff as you can. Often hiring managers are there. Worst case scenario, it's something that you can say when people are asking you what you've been doing to stay up to date. I've been going to networking events. I've been listening to speakers. I, you know, I'm very engaged, et cetera but it's a great way to network and find a job and find out where other people are getting jobs and to get a leg in. I have hired many, many, many people from networking events and I've seen people get hired from there as well. And this last part is important. What can I do while I'm waiting? So there will be downtime, right? In between applying for jobs. It, you know, you can't apply for jobs all day long Right. And so what do you do while you're waiting and when you have downtime or when you're not working another job or whatever? So uh, what will be very important for you? And this is and please, please, please do this, especially when you leave the school is stay as active as you can on things like Stack Overflow and GitHub. Uh, especially, you know, GitHub's probably even more important. Take on free projects. Help, help other people on there, you know, get your stars up on GitHub. Just stay active and, you know, it, appear as much like you really love doing this as, as I hope that you do, right? And so that will differentiate you from the other people that are in other code schools, I promise you. So please spend as much time as you can writing code. Uh, there are a million ways to do it and a million ways to stay busy without getting paid for it. And the more that you do that, the easier it will be to get a job. Not only will you be able to pass interviews easier, but it just sticks in people's mind when you tell them how much you write code and how much you enjoy doing it. And by the way, here's the proof. Here's my, here's my GitHub link or my Stack Overflow link or whatever. Stay engaged. Next slide, please. So let's see. Okay. All right. Interviews are, are not super scary, but they are. I know. I, I get it. Uh, and again, nobody is inherently good at interviewing. Interviewing sucks. Uh, and, and I know that. And I know that it's scary. And I also know that and I'm, I'm a pretty analytical person myself. Like, look, I get it. Like I, 
I'm an introvert. Like I do not like talking about myself in an interview. I, I don't like it. So, um, but here we go um, because we all have to do it and it's part of the job. And you, you know, maybe at some point in your career, you're, you'll get to the point where people just hire you and you don't have to interview because you have such a great reputation and they'll just make you offers, but that's pretty rare and you'll still probably have to interview. So uh, what to wear? Uh, it depends on which company you're going to. So I would, you know, you define this for yourself, but I would dress business casual for any interview in Portland, unless you're interviewing at a bank, right? If you're interviewing at a bank, like dress business, at any other company, do not wear a t-shirt, do not wear jeans to the interview, unless it's video and you can sit down and they can never see you. But what if you have to stand up? You just, you know, just like, just dress business casual. Do not wear a suit to an interview in Portland. That's, that's just as bad as wearing jeans. So I would, you know, I would just dress business casual. Um, phone versus video versus in person. So all of these things are going to be different and the interviews are, um, you're going to approach them quite differently. And I have interview prep in this, in these slides as well. So we'll talk about that, but basically you want to act the same in all three, right? And so in a phone interview, I would practice smiling, even if they can't see your face, it, it will change your attitude and change the way that you come across. Okay. Um, for phone, video, or in-person interviews, I would be prepared for that interview to start five minutes before and follow up with them five minutes after if you haven't heard. The worst thing that you can do is wait till the next day to follow up with them and say, hey, I never heard from you. Like to do it right away. Um, politely. Uh, for a video interview, make sure that you have a great connection, obviously. Make sure that your Wi-Fi is strong. Please don't do it like in your pajamas in your living room with Mountain Dew stains and, you know, your game controllers everywhere. Like, don't do that. <laughs> like, just, and I've seen this kind of stuff before, so please, please don't do that. Just, I would just be in a semi-professional area that looks normal or use some kind of background, right? So most, most, uh, most of the video platforms have some kind of fake background that you can use. Use one of those or be in a good place. Uh, and please, and this is important as well, because a lot of people forget to do it or just refuse, turn your camera on. I, that's the, one of the quickest ways to not get the job. And I see that very regularly and it doesn't matter how many, time I, how many times I tell people, turn your camera on and make sure that it's on and ask them if they can see you and they can hear you okay. Um, remember that the camera here is your eyes. So look into the camera, but normally, just like you would in real life, just like you don't stare in somebody's eyes while you're having a conversation with them the entire time, right? There, you, you look away, right? It's normal eye contact. So treat the camera as their eyes and have, try to have as much normal eye contact as possible. Don't like, don't dwell on it, but just try to be as normal as possible with the eye contact. This one's really important and we see a lot of people not get jobs, even if they're super qualified because they just didn't act interested or know why they were interested or know what the company does, right? And so I, you know, please don't find yourself doing research on the company one minute before the interview starts. Like know what it does, know what they do, know why you're interested. Um, you know, they're likely not going to ask you for a history lesson on their company, but at a basic level, they're probably going to ask you some version of why, why are you interested in us? And you better be prepared to answer that. Um, <laughs> along the same lines are having a couple of good questions prepared. I always tell people to avoid questions about compensation and work schedules. You don't need to ask them what time, you know, 
you're going to start and how much money they're going to pay you in the first interview. These are things that you can ask at some point. So I, you know, I definitely wouldn't ask that in the first interview, maybe ask HR that at some point. You can slide it into the third interview, maybe. Just trust that most companies are going to be somewhat normal. And you probably won't need to worry about it. Um, I have an entire slide on this next one, but uh, the STAR method, we'll talk about that in a moment. Situation, task, action, result. Uh, and it's, it's pretty important these days. Uh, next one is qualifying questions, such as, are, do you have any questions or concerns that I can address? Is there any reason why you wouldn't hire me? Right. That one can be a little aggressive, so feel it out, but qualifying questions are important. Uh, and then lastly, um, thank them for their time. Let them know that you're interested. And then I would follow up with a thank you note, either a traditional one where you send it snail mail or an email. The snail mail ones always go over super well, by the way, I'm serious. Like if you, if you know that they're in an office and you know where they are and you can send them a thank you note like that, like nothing is better than that. And like, they will find a place for you to work at that company if it's a nice thank you note. Yeah, that's good. All right, example interview prep. So I send this to everybody that's interviewing for us. And these are very basic things, but things that we all forget about. And I just talked about a lot of this stuff, but let's, let's go in a little bit deeper. So we don't need to worry about number one. We've already talked about that in detail. Number two, have those good questions prepared. It makes you look engaged. Number three, uh, do a deep dive technically. Be prepared for that. Even if, and I'm not talking about writing code. They should tell you ahead of time if you're going to have to whiteboard and write an algorithm or do something silly like that, right? A lot of companies still do that, unfortunately, and you're likely going to have to whiteboard and hopefully you're practicing how to do that in code school. But what I mean by this is that they will ask you a fairly high level question, like, do you have experience with Java? And they're not looking for a high level reply like, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> they're looking for, oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I've done this, this, and this, and this is kind of my project. Is that too much detail or do you want me to go further? Right? Like that's the kind of reply that they're looking for, if that makes sense. So, and we'll again, get into the star method on the next slide, but, um, but basically backing up your answers with concise examples is the best thing that you can do in an interview. So let's say that you are in the middle of an interview and they ask you, hey, do you have experience with Java? Absolutely. And I have done this, this, and this. And by the way, I have a recent project that I'd be more than happy to show you or discuss. Do you want to hear about it? And talk about it if they want to. That's That will leave people more confident <clears throat> than you just saying yes. Again, thank them for their time. Ask if they have any questions or concerns that you could address, and then ask them for next steps. That'll let them know that you're engaged. It'll also let you, it'll kind of give you a feel for whether or not you should waste your emotional effort on this any further, right? If they can't talk about next steps or they don't seem interested, or if they tell you that they're not interested, at least you can just move on to the next interview, right? To the next application. Uh, and assuming that they don't tell you to take a hike in number four, uh, and they probably won't, uh, tell them that you're super interested and that you are so thankful for their time and that you would love to hear from them soon. Yeah. All right. So just like uh, resumes are trendy, so are interviews. And this is the best method right now. And there will likely be a better method in the future. It's kind of like agile versus waterfall, right? So like in the past, you know, we, 
you know, we went through these like big six month, uh, you know, iterations of development and, um, and, you know, didn't release anything until there was no bugs and everybody in the entire company got to look at the code before it went to the customer. Now, now we're in a, a little different mode, right? That's a little bit more fast and iterative. So interviews are the same way, right? And so right now the star method is kind of what we're all looking for out of people. And why this is such a good method right now is because in some way you will be asked a situational question somehow. What did you do in this situation? And when you hear something like, what did you do in this? That's a situational question. And I would be prepared to answer those questions either from professional, like on the job or academic experience, what you've done here, right? And so in this project, that's a great question. In this project, I did this, right? And describe your, not your team's responsibilities, right? So your actual responsibilities in that project. I wrote this line of code for this project and deployed it. And here's a link. Okay. Um, again, the action part of this is explaining specific actions that you took to handle that situational question. Right. And so this was my part in it. This is what I did. And then lastly, why was it so great? So what was the outcome? So this kind of goes back to my interview prep section where we talked about giving examples. So when they ask you that kind of situational question, back it up with an example, it's way more, um, it's going to stick in their minds way more than you just saying yes, or yeah, I've done that, or coming up with some silly situation on the side, right? Like I would have a couple of examples in your head or written down that you read out loud a few times, that maybe you practice with somebody and answer those. So I'm sure that you have somebody in your life that you can work through a star method type question and answer with. So I would practice that. Practice asking, having somebody ask you a situation and you answering it. Yeah. So it looks like Matt says, um, are all our most recruiters looking for coding projects to hire people? No. I mean, do you mean from code schools? I'm assuming, yes. Yeah. So uh, Max, I think it was. Is that correct? It was Matt. Matt. Sorry, I heard Max. <laughs> so Matt. Hi, Matt. Um so Matt, I mean, I think that it's really important for you to talk about your projects that you've done in your resume, even if they're not paid, right? And we're not talking about you lying and put them in the professional section, right? So, but like actually having them in your resume, like a list of projects that you've done, okay? So I would... I would be prepared to go through the projects that you've done outside of code school and in. So at some point, look, I know that all of you will write code for some kind of project that's outside of this code school, right? Like, I don't know, let's just say that Davis tool has a problem and you, you guys are gonna write some code for it or whatever, I don't know and you're going to help deploy that. I, you know, it's going to be something that you can show. I would definitely put that under a projects section on your resume, regardless of what recruiter or what recruiter isn't looking for that. It's just going to make your resume look that much more relevant and real. So the bottom line is, yes, I will be looking for that on your resume and I'll be judging you accordingly, right? <laughs> I definitely wanna see that you that you spend time to write code and that um, you have a passion for it. 
that will be really obvious based on how much time you spend doing it, right? I tend to think takes certain things into consideration though, right? Yeah, you know, if you have five kids, you can't spend as much time doing that as somebody who doesn't. And that makes sense. And so it's all relative, relative I guess. Anyways, uh, do you need a degree for coding in order to get a job in that realm? Well, uh, Matt, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by degree. So uh, there are plenty of people that are writing code professionally and you know getting paid for it that do not have a degree. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but you know this kind of goes back to attitudes on code schools. Some uh, some companies have more of a traditional mindset where you need a bachelor's in computer science to be a software engineer. That's somewhat of a dated idea, right? So there are some companies who will not hire you without a degree. There are some that will. So I recently hired somebody for Phoenix Technologies who does not have a degree. Uh, I think they went to school for music but didn't finish. Um, so they do not have a degree that they can list. They also didn't go to code school. They just started writing code. And, you know, seven years into this thing, you know, I got them a really good job. But um, no, you don't need a degree. That being said, I mean, obviously, code school is super relevant, and I would put that under education. Questions? Keep them coming. If anybody has any questions they want to ask out loud, feel free to raise your hand and we'll just unmute the mics or just put them in the chat box, whatever you're more comfortable with. So question for Andrew, with uh, a student that comes to you that's just graduating a boot camp, what are, uh, what are the steps they're going to expect when they um, uh, use a recruiter, that type of thing? Yeah, they're going to have to speak with me on the phone, which is unfortunate, right? Or some other kind of recruiter. So you cannot just expect to send a recruiter your resume and for them to just send it to a client of theirs and for you not to have to talk to somebody. Unfortunately, you're going to have to talk to me or somebody like me. So that's one. Uh, two, we're going to ask for your resume. We're probably going to ask you for a little bit of your life history and why you're looking, why you love software, why you got into it. Um, we're likely or should be asking you for, you know, proof that you write code still and you do it without getting paid. So GitHub or something similar, right? Um, oh, it looks like, looks like we actually had a, another recruiter on the call. That's great. Hello. <laughs> Uh, yeah, feel feel free to connect with Robert Half. They're great too. They're 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 a big recruiting company. Um, anyways, those are basic the basic kinds of things that you're going to be asked to do. It's just nothing nothing earth shattering, right? And definitely, again, do not pay for a recruiting service. That, that would be fraud. There are no recruiting companies that charge candidates money. Yeah. Sarah, I believe that you had a question at the beginning too. Let's get to, I want to get to that for sure. Um, do you want to ask that now or should I move on to Eric's question? All right, I'm just uh, unmuting uh, Sarah's mic. Yeah. And go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, uh, just uh, to correct it, Sarah, um, but Sarah. thanks for coming back. No, all good. Thanks for coming back. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, I guess I came back, I come from a science background. Uh, I found myself going into global health policy. Um, so ideally, I, I wouldn't want to go through a whole bachelor's or master's route in order to get into the tech industry, which is why I really appreciate you asking, answering the other question. Um, but I just want to know how to frame kind of attending a boot camp in a way that makes kind of us more employable and um, what what sort of benefits can we draw on in the in the application process so first of all i would assume that you either have a bachelor's or a master's degree 
and yep. health policy, right? So probably a master's degree where you did some research and whatnot. First yeah, of all, yeah. super relevant degree, by the way. Um, very analytical, research driven. I would assume that you took several statistic courses and you could not have gotten out of that program without some kind of a, you know, somewhat relevant mathematical classes. And so, uh, first of all, well done. Uh, and that that's really impressive. Um, and so that will stand on its own quite a bit. The way to frame the code school is more of a, it's an addition to that, right? Like it just, it just makes it just a little bit more relevant to the jobs that you're applying to. So I think companies one will, will find your background super impressive, especially now that you went to code school and especially the fact that you're writing code out of school and that you have these projects that you can show, et cetera. So on your resume and how to, how to frame this and how to make it look good, right? So on the resume, you're going to want to have most of your professional experience be taken up by a project section. That's going to be the biggest part on your resume with your education at the top, right? Especially with an analytical degree like that, right? Like have it at the top and then go into the projects that you've done, the code school that you went to, et cetera. That, that will speak volumes on its own. Did I, did I answer your question, Sarah, or not? I can go into much more detail if you'd like. No, you definitely did. I think it was, um, it's good to know that we can kind of use the boot camp as a booster on top of the education that we've already sure. got. Please, okay. yes. That's great. Or, or as a booster to some other kind of, you know, background that was somewhat scientific. Yeah. Right. That's great. So, uh, yeah. Whether, whether, whether it's a, a, you know, university that you went to, or, you know, you spent, you know, 10 years as a diesel mechanic, right? Like th these are still very analytical things that require the same kind of mind problem solving ability. Uh, Eric, please. Hey, Andrew. Sorry if I'm out of breath. I'm actually at the gym working out. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you joining. Trying to, yes, sir. Just trying to be efficient. But uh, no, just to ease some people's mind, you know, on the which route should I take? You know, traditional bachelor's de degree in computer science, my, which my brother has, and he works at JB Hunt. He's now a software engineer too. But my point to that is, I have a brother-in-law who actually just recently graduated from the tech academy that's why i'm here now and within two weeks of graduating he landed a software engineering job with just the tech academy for your school so that's don't fantastic. think that if you don't have a computer you know a computer science degree that you can't get a job no you so, definitely and also, can. thanks for pointing that out eric yeah and also i just wanted to thank you for literally doing what you do because you of have course. a lot of wisdom in there right now and you're helping all of us so thank you absolutely you're very welcome yeah I, I do want to speak to that really quick, by the way. Are, are there Do other people have their hands raised right now? Cameron, did you want to ask something else again? Please do. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my question kind of came up while you were talking to Sara, because um, I, I come from, a, I guess, on the in, opposite end of the spectrum, right? I was, uh, was self-taught, and now I'm just finishing up my associate's degree for uh, on my engineering track. Uh, for mechatronics, but you know, before that, I was a I was like a manager at a, a for uh, a bike. I I, I was a, a sorry, I was service manager at, at a couple bike shops, like really yeah. high end. And so, yeah. I'm not I'm I'm having trouble like linking all of my experience in a cohesive way because I, I I think I come from a very non conventional background and it uh. It gives me a lot of strengths, but I'm still having trouble <laughs> yeah. wrapping that up and, and showing that off. Yeah. So Cameron, with somebody like yourself, if you were to give me creative rights to your resume, let's say, right? What I would probably do just from what you briefly told me is I would do all the things that I talked about on the resume. I would still make it somewhat chronological, maybe a little bit more functional though in this way, right? And so what I would do is I would have name, phone number, email at the top. And, you know, these are my abilities. 
you know, four or five of those and then talk about these are the projects that I've done and this is what I've spent the last two years doing. And this is my education. And then below that, I would have your bike shop experience. And I would probably leave no more than two or three bullets about what you did at those bike shops there. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would not, not spend any more space on your resume than that on that past experience. The super relevant stuff, although, although that's still relevant, right? Like, again, it's, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this, but you were not pumping gas, right? Like you were still doing things that required you to think creatively and to solve problems, right? And, and writing code is nothing more than being a professional puzzle solver, right? Like you were solving puzzles. So I would spend two to three bullets talking about things that you did there that were, you know, where you made, saved, or achieved the company something. Sorry, could you say that again? Yeah, uh, these are things that I call like MSA statements, made, saved, or achieved. Oh. Right, like, I solved this major problem and it saved the company $50,000. Right, so in, important to do on the resume. But the majority of what I would spend your resume on, again, if I had creative control of your resume, is talking about what you mentioned that you're super passionate about and what made you clearly smile, right? Like uh, your face lit up when you started talking about your, you know, what you've done since. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Of course. Next. Well, one thing, um, just to let like Sara know and everyone know, when you uh, enroll in a boot camp, um, especially with our boot camp, it's really a lot of practical training and it's really comprehensive. So you're doing a lot of projects and um, building a lot of things for your portfolio, but it's going to give you a lot of experience in a short amount of time. And um, we do go into the science part of it a bit, but it's a, you get a lot of it just from the practical training. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. That's great to put on your resume for sure. These are the things that people hire for. You come out of here already doing a project. You learn how to work on a team. Um, and I believe uh, that's probably for somebody here at this boot camp that wants to ask, ask that question. Okay, cool. Yeah, that Lucy. Yeah. Do you guys Go provide for training for having someone enter a boot camp? All of our boot camps actually start from a bottom up approach. So you don't need to have any um, technical experience in programming or coding. You know, we'll teach you everything from the bottom up, essentially. So, no. Uh, I want to leave you all with this bit of encouragement. Uh, this is the best candidate job market uh, in history, especially uh, from, you know, in technology. We have never seen anything like this. Uh, this completely blows the 2012 job market out of the water. And that was a really good job market, right? So after every disaster, there's a recovery. And this is the biggest recovery that we've seen in modern history. So please, please, please be encouraged by that. Apply and take advantage of it. Like you have more opportunity now coming out of something like this or starting to learn how to code than anyone else in history. So I may all of you become full-time software developers being paid for it and really enjoying what you do. And hopefully that means that you get compensated accordingly. Well, we've got yeah. to build the metaverse, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, web, web three, right? Uh, it's here. So uh, yeah. Feel free to contact me. Uh, you have my contact information there. If you think that I was too weird, there are uh, several other recruiters that work with us that are fantastic, that have been with us for many, many years. Um, my tenure at Vander Helen is not rare, so feel free to reach out to, out to anyone else here. Uh, and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to help anytime. 
Sounds good, Andrew. And I just want to make sure, Eric, do you have one last question? All right. Oh, hey, yes, sir. I was just going to further elaborate on you guys. I guess I'm bragging on the Tech Academy, but I feel like we're we right now that. I'm in the Python. Yeah, well, I think you deserve it, honestly, because right now I'm in the Python Live project, and I just wanted to say to anybody considering Tech Academy that I really believe that that's what sets you guys apart is because you teach not just coding, but the, the logistics, like, you know, with agile methodology and daily scrums and using a Azure DevOps and I feel like that's really important if you don't have a degree or anything like that, you know, and an employer is going to look at your resume, they're going to see that you actually know how to work with other coders and how to implement source control and stuff like that on GitHub, which is really important. That's all I really wanted to say. Yeah, we appreciate that. And the uh, live projects yes, at, at the end um, are really integral to our program. Um, it's basically yeah. like an internship for two weeks. Um, just before graduation, and they're they're really good for our students. That's huge. That is huge. There are plenty of uh, four-year CS degree programs, by the way, that have no internship program. That just kick people out onto the street with you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in school bills. Yeah, Andrew, you're actually right. Because remember how Tony earlier about my brother, he uh, he graduated from the University of Arkansas with a CS degree. I told him I'm about to start the live project, and he told me, yeah, he was like, man, I, we literally do those daily scrums, and we use uh, Azure at my job, and he said, they never taught me any of that when I was in school, so I know for a fact that it's very unique with Tech Academy. Yeah, it's good, it's good stuff. All right. Uh, feel free to send me uh, your, your resumes if you, if you want help on them. Feel free to call me or reach out or whatever. I look forward to working with you all in the future regardless. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andrew. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Really good presentation. And we'll uh, have you back soon. Okay. All right. Later, guys. Yeah, totally. Thank you. See ya. And then just really quickly, um, next week, um, next week's Tech Talk is going to be another job-based um, presentation. Uh, Daniel Midland, he's going to be speaking on finding the best um, job for you in the tech industry and how to keep that. I also provided some links just to the Tech Academy's website, um, our Tech Talk playlist, and our Tech Talk schedule on Meetup. So yeah, thank you everybody so much for joining. Uh -huh. um, Andrew did a great job, hope you enjoyed. Yeah, have a great yeah. rest of your week. Yeah, thank you for that, appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all, all right. for all. All right, thanks all, have a good weekend.